Hey, Dame. Yo. Do you happen to have any idea who this episode is brought to you by? <laughs> oh, I think I have a clue. I think I know. <laughs> this episode of Ergo is brought to you by Overcast, an independent podcast app that embraces the open world of podcasting instead of locking it down. No exclusives, no premium content, no paywalls, just a great podcast app for everyone. And if you know Ergo, we love independent and we love shit not being locked down. So <laughs> so go ahead and get Overcast for free on the App Store. Hey, hey. Hello. This is Ergo. What's up? What's up, Kiss? How you doing? I am good. How are you, Dame? I am feeling great. We have special, unexpected surprise guests. <laughs> Some know her as Lori Lightfoot. Not that Not one. that Lori Lightfoot. Don't worry. <laughs> we, have, we have not jumped the shark that yeah. hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be a turn of events. <laughs> <laughs> We're but here no, to bring we in the light here. this week on Ergo. <laughs> <laughs> With amazing comedian... Actress, producer, space maker, plant enthusiast, the, the hilarious and phenomenal Lisa Beasley. As David mentioned, many people, including, I think, initially us, uh, knew Lisa from the incredible impression she's been doing of Lori Lightfoot, uh, our infamous mayor. But of course, as is often the case, Lisa is a you know multi-talented, multi-hyphenate performer, producer, space maker, uh, graphic designer who's not new to comedy and to performance. So it was really exciting to get to learn from her, kind of get a, a sense of, of what it takes to create this character and all the other work she does, um, and just get to know, you know, what motivated her to come to this character as well. You know, also got introduced to some of her work, you know, working with other Ergo alum, alum Dwayne Perkins on 3P Comedy that was connected through Comedy Central, uh, has also made appearances on the hilarious South Side. And it was really great to be able to, you know, not only talk to... One, just a, a very like confident, self assured person. I think I felt like a little Which bit. Which is a so relief, like, honestly. Yeah, after talking let me, to myself all week. <laughs> let, let me get my shit together a little bit. Uh, but, but really was a treat to dig in on some of the, I think, most impactful political satire, you know, I've seen almost ever, you know, because it's really connected to, to local political struggle, to, to community work, and to like, voicing an experience that I think a lot of people in this city had of like a frustration that was boiling over. And so to bring humor in a, in a cathartic type way was very like, I think therapeutic for us collectively. So, so, so Lisa B is a real gift to, to our city and community. You should follow Lisa at Lisa B evolving everywhere. Uh, as always, you can follow Ergo at Ergo radio, subscribe, rate, review the podcast, wherever you do those types of things. Um, and yeah, I think without further ado, let's hop into it with the one and only Lisa Beasley. Let's get it. That, uh, that plant is thriving behind you. You know what? I've been keeping the, all the plants that I have alive going on a year now and, and I rounded up about four months, but <laughs> I'm keeping them alive. <laughs> yeah, once you get past seven, you can say a year. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I'm waiting for it to do that thing where it starts draping. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. no, it still it still has some verticality to it at this point. Yeah, I've never heard the word verticality ever in my life. <laughs> and now I'm using it. <laughs> verticality is a word. I don't know. Is verticality a word? <laughs> It sounds, what else would you call the act of being vertical? I'm not a stand-up. I'm I, I'm a practitioner of verticality. <laughs> <laughs> also, funny. I'm a big fan of rounding up months. Anything <laughs> vertical funnies. About. <laughs> yeah, I was realizing that I was in like a little like meet and greet thing. So we all had to like go around and introduce ourselves in the circle. And I was talking about this job I've been like working with. I'm like, yeah, I've been doing it for the last year and a half. And that's why I was like, really? And then I realized it was the person that had the job before me. And like, <laughs> and I was like, wow, I didn't realize you was over there that long. Yeah. <laughs> so like, you know Sharon. It's been, it's been about 13 and a half months. You know, that feels like a whole extra half. <laughs> yeah, you're right. No, no, no problem with a roundup most of yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah. I saw it right mm -hmm. past. I've been there a year. That didn't sound as strong. I tried that uh kind of subconsciously in my relationship for the first couple of years. Yeah. I, I would I was rounding up and be like, we've been together a year and a half. And she'd be like, we have not been together a year. 
You know, I've never been good with anniversaries of any kind. Like you have some people who like, I moved to Chicago on October 13th. I've never been good with markers of time like that. Markers of tragedy where it's like, it's been three years since my dog died, (laughs) like that type of stuff, but never like the good stuff. I need to look at the, look into that. Mm. Yeah, like a a trauma anniversary. Here's my, here's, (laughs) here's my secret is you got to pile up anniversaries. On good days, do extra good things. So I got I got committed, married, or whatever. And the way that I planned it out was I proposed on her birthday. Did you say committed, was, married? You know, marriage is a is a construct that is there was a dash. I got committed slash married. I was using different. For well, everybody in the audience, it was a wedding. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. Committed <laughs> married. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. So proposed on her birthday, got married on our already established anniversary so we're not we're not spreading this out throughout the calendar so just like when something's good happened plan for the next good thing to happen there and that way we're just doing everything on june 14th like my nephew was born on her birthday so that's just two birthdays ready to go december 28th we just out the door so or that's my you can match a good day with a traumaversary. Ooh. And you're like, yeah, this is the day dad died, but also happy anniversary, babe. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully it wasn't the actual same day. <laughs> yeah. The same year. <laughs> All right. Well, shall we, shall we do the thing? I feel ready. We are so excited to be getting to know, hanging out, and talking with Lisa Beasley. Yeah, yeah let's get it. <laughs> Strong finger guns. <laughs> Machine guns, too. Pew, pew. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So we're going to hop right in here. We have a, a tradition that we like to start with, and it, it's a two-part question that we check in with, and, and it is centered around time. So in this time, and define time as you will, this hour, this day, this season, this lifetime, how is the world treating you and how are you treating the world? That's a really good question. In this time, and and I look at time as cyclical and nonlinear. So right now, I'm giving the world a lot of calm because I'm very anxious. I have anxiety. And so I've been like really making sure I'm staying chill, taking care of myself. And I feel like the universe is giving peace back to me. You sow chaos, you reap chaos. But like you sow peace, you reap peace. So I feel like the world has been giving me a lot of space, quote unquote, time and freedom. Yet I also think that's a direct reflection of me seeking out space, time and freedom. (laughs) (laughs) I love the idea of peace sowing. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the uh, if you sow chaos, you reap chaos and vice versa. it gets easier to believe the more that it happens. But you know, the first couple of times you're like, I'm trying to bring a little calm and things still feel a little chaotic around. It's a lot of like trust that it'll, it'll get to there. What is that creating or, or sowing some, some, some peace look like for you day to day? And and how does that fit into your performer life and all that? Yeah. So there are times where I don't scroll on social media cause I just can't. My bubble is, fake and perfect like my social media (laughs) bubble is highly curated I don't so when people say stuff like oh they're posting about this and that and stuff they don't like I'm like I don't I don't see that because I unfollow it so I have like nothing but magical black people just all up and down my timeline but what I've started to notice is if I'm scrolling something happens where I don't see something I don't like and I feel it in my body and I just start to feel bad and so I stop And so lately I've been just being on there less and less and less. And I know how to post a lot, but not look. I'm learning to create without and not consume. Oh, you found a sweet spot. Yeah, yeah. And that also takes a lot of confidence too, right? Because if you worried about, it's the confidence of, I know that what I'm creating has never been done. So I don't have to look and see if anybody's doing it. Mm -hmm. Um. (laughs) And if they are, the way I do it is still going to be so different. It's not going to matter. So I've been protecting my cyber energy. Um, Routines help me out a lot. I drink a lot of water. Do you think there's a correlation between people who hydrate themselves well and hydrate their plants well? 
You have a very well hydrated mm. plant behind you. And I'm propagating a plant. This is the first plant that is growing roots. And it's kind of freaking me out a little bit because mm-hmm. all these little things sticking out was not there at all. Like water be life and this shit is wild. <laughs> yeah. I do think there is a correlation, maybe, because the thing with plants, though, that I'm learning is it's about pruning away the dead leaves because they're, they're not necessary anymore. Plants are very interesting. I have a um, plant consultant. Uh, say you're wealthy without saying you're wealthy. <laughs> I have a, a plant consultant. I've um, never heard of, of such a thing. <laughs> yeah. JY Plants on Instagram. And every time she talks to me about my plants, it's like life. She's like, yeah, you don't need that. You don't need that dead stuff there. What do you need that energy there for? And I'm just like, you're right. I don't need him in my life no more. <laughs> I don't know why I pictured the plant consultant being a plant itself. Like, like, like little, little half moon glasses. <laughs> what you have to do little is yellow no pan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But but the other thing about those dead leaves is, and this is I remember learning this at some point in the last couple of years, is it's not just that they died on their own a lot of the time. It was the energy that they expended that enabled it to grow. So they fall to the wayside because the energy that was going into keeping that leaf alive was directed toward helping it grow up or grow new leaves or stuff like that. So it's not just useless. I'm totally that person. I talk to my plants. And I don't think it's a coincidence at all that while my mental health is stable, my plants are thriving. There was a period in time I couldn't keep a plant alive because it was absorbing a lot of my energy and just just being like, we can't live here and dying. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Wait, time out. I, th- I feel like our audience is going to be disproportionately plant friendly. <laughs> and you just threw out this young plant consultant like it was something that oh, they yeah. just do. <laughs> and so how could a listener, if they are struggling <laughs> with their plants, exactly why don't right. we shout out this plant That's consultant? That's just like not something service. you Google. Let me find, because I need to make sure it's a Y or a V before I just go saying stuff. Yeah, J-Y plants with a Z. On Instagram. So out here consulting your plants. Yes, it's consulting my plants. She's a gardener. She's a black plant queer with a healthy obsession for plants. You can schedule your live. J, this is me auditioning if you ever want me yeah, to read it. It's, it's a good line read, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> this is all the voiceovers on the book. Um, you can join the JY Plants tribe. All things JY Plants and opportunities to support. She does plant exchanges. You can like, cut off a piece of your plant and give it to somebody else. It's very sweet. (laughs) Yeah. No, that's that's deeply wholesome. Um, Yeah. (laughs) But it also seems like, so, you know, in the bit of time that I've known your work and have followed you on the internet, and it's- Since 2011, right? (laughs) Oh, yeah. Since 2011. Okay. (laughs) You know, back when when you needed a .edu for Facebook. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Oh my God, 2011. That joke is funny that I re- that's way further than <laughs> I realized. That's Yikes. a long ass time ago. Yeah. I still think it's That's when I was writing my blog for the game. You remember the show, The Game? I did uh-huh. the recap after the show. You... Official recap or unofficial recap? It was the unofficial official <laughs> recap. <laughs> That was maybe a like passive aggressive question. The, yeah. the game is pretty expositional and they like recap as they're telling you. I, feel like I don't feel like you're missing a lot. I don't, I don't know how much between the live reading you can do for the game. But it was I the lowest, the, the lowest stake show to recap. <laughs> It also had some of like the highest ratings in television history. I'd like to credit my blog. <laughs> yes. It was, the, it was the secondary content that took it to the next level. <laughs> you know, they made that Game of Thrones podcast building off of your work here. You know, exactly. Was, exactly. You really created a new lane is what, is I what happened. I did. A lot of people don't know that. <laughs> uh, but, but in the time since, you know, 1985 that I've been following you on the internet. Thank you. Um, it like doesn't feel one out of character that you would know a plant consultant. Um, <laughs> mostly not as a, a statement about you, but more as like, I feel like you have a working knowledge of like people in your sphere doing cool, unique things on their own terms. Um, mm. And that I feel like is, you know, again, in the time I've seen your work, very akin to how I've seen you move is like, I have this idea. I'm trying to build it. I'll see what happens. It doesn't have to always be at the biggest scale. Some things do get there. Some things don't. But I want to pursue this and see where this goes. Does that ring true? Yes. And thank you for acknowledging that. I feel like 
my whole approach to what I do is like, there's so much talent. There's so many people clearly doing things. So like, for example, anything I do weed related, I partner with Black Magic Potions, who is my friend who just started their edible cannabis business. They're not big. They're not huge. But I'd rather partner with them than raw cones. I just feel like it's all about the come up for everybody. And also as a producer, resources is also important too. So just like I've always been somebody who always thought of ways to come up and make money and do things like it started when I was in elementary school. Like I would make, I would be the girl going to Michael's making pillows and buying stuff in and being like, okay, you can order your pillow. You want cloud print? You want rainbow print? Like I was always about that. And I recognize that in other people. And I'm a big fan of entrepreneurship and people doing their own thing because after navigating systems and institutions, it all can be better. And while I navigate and try to make those spaces better, I really do like creating opportunities for other people because it's it's about confidence building and people realizing like, oh, wow, somebody recognized me for my gift, introduced me to other people or gave me a vendor space or gave me a platform or gave me an interview or gave me something that gives people confidence in their ideas. And that's what makes them keep going. By the time somebody is ready to put something out into the world, they've already faced a lot of low self-esteem, a lot of shit. Nobody just wakes up and it's like plants. I'm confident about plants, plants, plants. There had to have been some type of people know me as an actor. Why am I pursuing plant? Like da, 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 da. so many people already doing it. Da, 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 woo. And I really do love creating things from nothing. And I admire people who create stuff from nothing because it really, as cheesy as it sounds, it comes from their soul and it comes from unseen places. And when people make things tangible, that's really special. And put it this way, I could definitely see myself doing like Oprah's favorite things in 15 years where I'm just just a magazine of like, this person made up cannabis holder. I just really love when people do their own thing and make their own opportunities because that really is the only reason people are surviving. Because if it was up to the system at large, we'd all literally would be working robots. Yeah. I want to uh, jump back to the pillows briefly. Um, I know you just said a lot, but that's... Good call. I was going to skate past the pillows, and this this is important. First business. I should pick it back up. I mean, one, I think it would do very well. That's like begging for Etsy. Um, But I'm curious what other uh, childhood hustle entrepreneurship ideas you had. Okay. So it started when... Uh, My auntie would watch me after school because my parents worked. So we would walk to her house after school. And she was the lady in the neighborhood who sold pops, sodas, depending on where you're from. But how you say it is pop. This is when home candy stores were a really big thing where like somebody's mom, you go into their basement and they'd have a candy store. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It would be thousands of pieces of penny candy that kids can afford because they got a nickel. So that's how I understood profit because I knew how much pops cost because sometimes she would sell wild ones and I knew they was 10 cents, but we were selling them for 50 cents. And I was like, oh, she's making 40 cents a can. (laughs) So just um, flipping Tootsie Rolls. Yes. So I started to do that at school. I would empty out my backpack. I wouldn't take my (laughs) my books and I would have like chips and Capri Sun. And my whole thing was my stuff was cold because I put the Capri Suns in the freezer. I put towels and paper towels in the bottom of my backpack and I put the chips and candy on top. Um, no chocolate. Chocolate melted. That was a, you know, <laughs> a bad Did investment. Did you learn that one the hard way? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Bad investment. You can't sell <laughs> just a handful of chocolate kisses if they're not shaped like nothing. So <laughs> that was because I knew that kids were hungry now. <laughs> mm-hmm. I couldn't wait till lunch. And chips cost 25 cents, but you'll pay 50 cents if they're right there right now. So that was one hustle. The pillows was one hustle. Before I even knew what graphic design was, we had a computer in the house. So I would make people like business cards on um, paint. And it would just be like, I don't know, people used to make mixed CDs a lot. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, you need a business card. (laughs) (laughs) I love this. What else would I do? We don't have to talk about the the dabbling in, in um, helping friends sell weed when <laughs> it was illegal. I mean, every kid in the hood did that 
once or twice or for two years um, <laughs> what else was oh i did nails uh for a little bit with press-ons i would like decorate press-on nails and sell those now that i think about it wait a minute this was before like decorative press-on nails was like a thing i was on to something yet again i really respect the snack temperature control because if I were running for superintendent of something, I feel like the way you win kids over is talk about how brutal the like congealing of school lunch in various forms <sighs> is. Like you bring it from home. If it was warm at home, it's terrible now. If it was cold at home, it's still a little frozen. School lunch temperatures are always way off. Like there's so many foods that are good that were bad at noon. You know, yeah. like they you lose the quality as the cheese congeals. And that's the plank of my platform. This is reminiscent. I, I too, there was a year I, I had a huge cooler at my little portable candy store. And this <laughs> is obviously, I did grades in, in a weird way, but I was in a, in a fourth grade. <laughs> that sounds, <laughs> I was it sounds young, like but... you weren't enrolled, David. <laughs> <laughs> I was in one it's, it's, like I, it's like I went to I've, college. I've done four means grades I in, a, college. in a few different scenarios, but <laughs> yeah. but this is one of <laughs> one of those times I was in a fourth grade class. When I was twenty, you're... I decided to go back to the fourth grade. <laughs> <laughs> it was a it was a Happy Gilmore type situation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I had this igloo cooler, and I was like able to go through all the like I would go to the eighth graders because I was cool with them. I would go down to the second graders all the way through. And my goal was just $10 a day in revenue. And like, you know, that doesn't sound like a lot, but as a, I was probably eight. That's a lot of money for an eight-year-old. And it's in singles. If you pull out a wad of $50 at the end of the week. (laughs) (laughs) You was that boy. (laughs) Yeah. We would go to stores sometimes. My mom just like, if it was some $3, she would just like, go ahead, pay for it. Just like show off in front of the clerks. And I would pull out this (laughs) He got his own money. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's that's igloo yeah. money. <laughs> yeah, 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 oh, yeah. and I made bracelets and keychains. So when like the the ones with the rubbery like string, you I knew it was cool gonna be a lanyard situation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Wow. So kind of using this like background of like seeing things that aren't there and like creative spark to kind of fill gaps, but also a lot of interaction, right? Because that's a big part of what commerce is. Is like. You got to talk to people. You got to follow up. You got to hit them. Right. There's a lot of people engagement in your thinking of your story or your trajectory. Does that connect at all to your entry point into performance and creative arts or? Absolutely. It, just- it absolutely. It, it actually reminds me of some of my failures as a graphic designer because I'm a talented graphic designer, but I, w- I sucked at customer service. And, and that's what made me realize the instances in which I like collaborating with people and the instances in which I don't. And I would much rather do it as like a co-collaborative thing as opposed to a client graphic designer relationship. Because I knew I had the power to create, but that doesn't mean I should open myself up to create for everybody. I also did like legit legit business for four or five years. I've considered myself an entrepreneur all my life, but this was the first time where it was like employees and shit. It's, it ain't, <laughs> it's all. <laughs> <laughs> the disdain for the employee taxes relationship. Yeah. yeah, taxes and shit. <laughs> um, and it was like the idea of how I like to communicate and collaborate with people to create it was evident in some of those like graphic design failures of like, I don't want to create with people in that way. Let's say somebody wants something. They don't know what they want. I give them something that's perfect in my mind because I created it. And then that's when they become the graphic designer. And that back and forth used to just really, really rub me wrong. And when you're truly collaborating with people, there is no back and forth or the back and forth is truly productive. It's not combative. So creating my own lanes and seeing so many of the ideas that I created by myself be executionable helped me in those situations where when I create now as a performer, I'm like, I know this could work because I've did this so many different times in so many different ways with so many different other groups of people. And it's reinforced my confidence as a leader where oftentimes I do have to remind people like, this ain't my first time here. (laughs) (laughs) Um, 
because of those transferable skills that people don't know about, they only see what comes in the door. So as a leader and as like a black woman who's had businesses and have businesses and plants and plants that I take (laughs) care of that are thriving, they don't know that I learned about profit when I was nine years old in my auntie's house. You know what I mean? They, they, they think because they've come across so many people who don't have the knowledge that I have, but have an idea. I have to be mindful to let people know. And I'm working on the humility part of that because it used to be like, yo, you need to know who the fuck I am. (laughs) But now it's just like, let me, you know, or it could happen this way or like, hey, you don't have to worry. I'm here now. (laughs) Yeah. Well, yeah, I think it's such a good example. What could I what I imagine could have been a good example of this, you know, recently seeing the how how you pulled together the Laugh Factory Teachers Appreciation Night. It was such an interesting kind of lesson from the outside of, you know, what do I do now that people are saying, what do you want to do with this? Mm -hmm. Um, And I so one, I just thought that was a really like beautiful way to pull that together. And it seemed like it was really successful. But there's so many things that go into making a show beyond what happens on the stage, you know, kind of on a base level. What was it like putting that night together? What stands out from it now a few weeks after? Uh, Maybe you could give a little bit of the backstory to it. Yeah, I am so glad that unfolded transparently the way it did because that happening like that in front of everybody's faces actually now gives me leverage in future conversations because it shows people what I've been doing, which is being a beast. Because (laughs) to put a show together in five days that sells out at a venue is not easy but it's easy for me when i got interviews about it like in the time it was happening they were like yeah so tell us more i was like you know what i know you (laughs) saw the tweet that was it and and for me it's one of those things where it's like i've got so tired of people wasting my time with hour-long meetings 45 minute calls Ooh. emails that don't mean shit, ah. strategy sessions. And I'm like, yo, how come I can't know what's already supposed to happen? Like, I have step one through A through B through Z. I already, I already did it. Why? Why, 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 why? People think something like what I did can't happen without that. They think there's a lot more to the story, but that's how skilled I am. One of the main things that I wish people could remember is I produced WakandaCon. So that was like the Laugh Factory show times a thousand, where it's like I put together a lot of panels that was happening in one or two days. So essentially, it was just like me doing one little tiny event that kind of goes to show the capacity that I have to hold to be able to do stuff. But this is actually what fascinated me about that show was being able to show people like, yeah, it don't take all of that when I'm there. It might take all of that when you're there because somebody else wanted me to do a show a couple of months out. They're like, yeah, can we meet? I said, for what? (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm taking care of my plants. Um, (laughs) I have a consultation later. (laughs) Right. Schedules book. It really took me standing in that power of being like, I know I look 22 and I know you think I'm just a comedian, but it's like I'm not. And I think also that show generated real revenue that came out of nowhere. If you're looking at a dark night in a theater and you're looking at a place that has a two drink minimum with 200 people showing up, that's money. What that night meant for me is to lean into I know what I'm doing as an artist and as an artist who wants to sustain myself and invest in my own stuff where when I reach out to a comedy theater in Kentucky because I just so happen to be in town and I'm like yeah five thousand dollars and they're like we give artists forty (laughs) five dollars I'm like well well I won't do it here because I actually could have made y'all some money way more than you thought because the truth is I sell out every single show I do because I have a formula for it. Not necessarily because I'm that big of a beast and everybody's fighting to see Lisa Beasley live. I just know how to sell out shows because I've been doing it since I was in college. 
And I think because people don't know I'm 35, they don't know I have like low key 20 years of experience <laughs> <laughs> doing stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I, I want to go back a little bit uh, in that experience because, um, you know, just in in doing the, the aforementioned bio research, uh, the thing that really jumped out to me was th- these little oases of space to make exactly what you want either within a larger institution or within like a larger theater scene. Um, so whether that's in, you know, Chicago having, uh, you know, being, being connected to three Pete or even like in some ways the show Southside kind of felt like that to me of like this little gem oasis that if you blinked quick, like you couldn't quite believe that it could exist. Mm-hmm. When you're thinking about in that kind of producer role of building this space, whether that's in person or some other project, what are you kind of hoping that feels like for you and for the people who are engaging with it? You know, and that can be something as simple as what they're watching on IG or, you know, a room that they're in. I basically I want to make it fun and enjoyable for everybody. So when I think of producing an experience, I don't think of the audience as the only audience. I think of everybody as the audience of the experience. I want the person who runs the Laugh Factory to have a good time and to be like, wow, this was cool. And we did something great. And wow, like that's that's really cool. I want the person who's running the social media to have fun and to also be not pressed about anything. I think one thing is because I've decided to stick to having fun and doing the things that I want to do, if anybody's pressed around me for doing improv, we are doing it wrong. <laughs> if anybody <laughs> around me is over. <laughs> Yeah, if anybody around me is stressed and I'm getting on stage and really, truly going off the cuff, <laughs> it's not worth it. So um, when I think about like even um, attempting my own like sets for a film and stuff, I want everybody to feel like they're included and they feel safe and they could have fun and it not be a big deal. And they don't feel like if they mess up, they're going to get fired or the show's ruined. Um, and that also comes with me liking to have as much stuff figured out as possible before the day of. So everybody's just cool. I do believe that laughter is healing. I'm one of those people where it's like, laughter is important. I'm I'm just as important as a doctor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I really just want everybody to have a good time and feel like they're in their purpose and feel like they want to be there. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I want people to take away like a memorable, good experience because what it is for me It also is kind of selfish, too, because I'm creating the circumstances in which I like to thrive. And my time on stage is it's like it's the only time literally nobody can bother me. Or it's when truly the hard things about my life really don't matter. Or I can use that to emote or get points across or, quite frankly, just be heard. So I know it helps if people around me have what they need. And if they're chill and relaxed and, you know, I don't like anything that feels like workity work, work, work. I'm quick to light a blunt everywhere I go and offer anybody who partakes just like, yeah, this is a show where you can kick it because I am dressed in a big suit and a horrible wig (laughs) (laughs) and I'm making fun of the mayor and no one knew we were going to be here eight days ago. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah let, let's live in that in that little bit of yeah um, let's go it's, I, had, I had a different question um but yeah we we, we gotta dig in um because you have skyrocketed to <laughs> become one of just the favorite people of of people that do things at the intersection of like being really funny and just like the the visceral feeling of, oh, someone is doing something clever and mm-hmm. good and witty and well executed. Uh, but also with this other axis of like a timely responsibility, you know, your work satirizing, spoofing our infamous mayor here in Chicago, Lori Lightfoot, was so poignant and so needed for a community that felt like a real frustration. Uh, yeah. and you And you became this like very healthy in the sense of like a doctor like very healthy like life affirming kind of exhaust to this bubbling up or boil and like they were you know 
in all of Chicago politics, because it goes back before Lori Lightfoot, especially during this administration, there's not much time for laughs. laughs. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think using the show as like kind of the end point, I want to go back and then work our way forward, you know, to to the moment of, of with the teachers. But what? Prov- no, 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 no. Not even like I'm going to do it. When was the moment that you realized you could do it of like, OK, oh. there's uh-huh. there's the voice, there's the mannerism. And also, like, I don't know if this is a, your toolbox, too, but like the makeup work of it. Right. Like there's a <laughs> there was a real <laughs> it was like, oh, damn, this nigga look like Lori Lightfoot for real. <laughs> it took me a while yeah. to even realize because I had been following you. It took me a second to recognize that that, that was you it took a minute. So take us back to that moment of. Damn, I kind of look like Larry Lightfoot. Yeah, right. Which is like no thought nobody wants to have. <laughs> so go, go back to a difficult moment in your life, right? We're like, were you oh, roasting shit. yourself? <laughs> so I remember November 2020 is when I went viral for Margaret Thatcher, and then I remember specifically thinking, like, oh. People think I'm going to do the thing that Internet people do when they get known for one thing. They just do that thing. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I'm not going to sit up here and be like, huh, for a year. I'm like, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm just going to use this opportunity to show you all that I'm just talented and I just like doing random stuff. And truly, 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 I don't know how to explain this, but I really do be up in this house cracking myself up (laughs) and that's when I know it has to go on the internet it really starts with me (laughs) I'd be like this is funny (laughs) yeah so it was the beginning of the year and two things happened simultaneously I decided to take my braids out and a lot of people was flaming Lori Lightfoot on the internet. She was just doing a lot of stupid stuff all at once. Uh-huh. Where like all of a sudden it was like CPD money spent. It, like it was just so many things. And I saw so many black people on Twitter who you would think don't have their ears to the ground on politics. When you make, let me tell you something. There is nothing more that black people want than to not be involved with America. So when you have, (laughs) (laughs) when you have black people where Keisha, who does nails on Twitter, is like, yo, the mayor is wild. (laughs) Just municipal participation. (laughs) So, and then my sister would send me stuff about her. Like she's so goofy. And I would just see the headlines and I would see the things she would say. And then I, At the time, I decided to wear my hair short and, like, embrace my natural hair. But when it's not done or combed, (laughs) I was like, yo, I can make myself look like Lori Lightfoot. (laughs) And... What a just living in that moment. I was like, this is an opportunity. It's like a Spider-Man Venom so, type situation. Like, oh shit, he's in me all so, along. So it, it was the look before the voice. It was the look before the voice. And then I <laughs> I got some gray spray paint. I got it, but I hadn't used it yet. And then I had just so happened to, oh shit, this is this is some real shit. Damn. I had just so happened to book a series um, called The Zen Room. It was just like a dream week where I was like an actor for a week, like on <laughs> set. Like, And Mercedes Small did my makeup. That's where I met her. And she does my makeup a lot now. And she had me looking good. <laughs> And so the contrast, <laughs> I, I felt I felt like, you know what, because the Internet sees me being this pretty, I can do Lori now because they know how pretty I am. <laughs> and see the glow. No one was having the first thought of you look like Lori. Like, like that came secondary. <laughs> yeah. So then one day I came back from set and I wore wigs on that show. So it was real easy for me to unbraid my hair. And my hair is longer than hers. But because of my shrinkage, all I have to do is wet it. And then it shrinks back up 
And getting ready as Lori Lightfoot is so easy. It takes three <laughs> minutes. You For really, her too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I don't purposely make the collars look like that. I literally just throw the clothes on and go. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> just spray my hair and just go. You probably put more time into it than she <laughs> Right? And I, uh, and I remember the first day I did it, I just had so much fun because I was transitioning from being on set pretty to just like, because this is when the TikTok trend was really cool where you put your hand up and now you're pretty. <laughs> so I just did the reverse where it was like, I'm cute now. It's like, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. That's what I knew. And it was so funny because people was like, Oh, girl, where you get that wig? Oh, this hairline. I was like, that's my hairline. <laughs> so so really, you know, this that that uh the preliminary stories of that 20 years of like confidence and self-assurance and like I'm the shit and I can sell anything out and I can make my own graphics and I can sell my candy and my plants like I, I am the master of my universe like had to you needed that barrier to protect you oh yes oh absolutely absolutely <laughs> oh, so here's why I appreciate it so much so we talked and you know a lot of people listen know like I grew up in comedy my, my dad's a comedian all my uncle's godfather's is comedians. Um, so I just love silly shit and performance <laughs> off the bat. But I also now, I'm sure a lot of folks know, like live this very serious life as well and have, you know, been very politically engaged and, you know, have been a part of a cohort of, you know, young, we ain't young no more, but was, <laughs> young, <laughs> was young black people um, who began politically opposing Lori before she was even the mayor. So I don't even know if you know how she kind of came to prominence. A lot of people missed it. So, you know, <laughs> we've never had a good one. So, you know, the, the predecessor is Rahm Emanuel, except mm-hmm. for Harold, obviously. Got to sh- shout out my boy, um, <laughs> <laughs> Harry Dub. All right. Uh, <laughs> so just just for folks who are tuning in, I kind of missed the moment of how she came in, into prominence. Uh, so, you know, Rahm Emanuel, Anita Alvarez, McCarthy, whatever his Gary, first name Gary is. McCarthy. Fuck him. Gary McCarthy. Yeah. Fuck face McCarthy. Um, <laughs> you know, cover up a bunch of murders specifically the the killing of laquan mcdonald which was captured on tape and that basically toppled that political establishment and while that crisis was was brewing and budding the chicago police department was in the process of deciding what to do with the officer who killed rakia boyd dante Servin. Mm -hmm. so every month you know this movement cohort was going to chicago police board meetings demanding that this officer be fired and he not get his pension because usually officers after they kill people just get to retire in comfort um, with public resources. And so what Rahm Emanuel did as the apt politician that he was is like, oh, there's a intersectional, you know, movement that is centered around blackness, queerness, black queer femme, black women. I'm going to put the black queer woman in front of them. And she became, you know, one of the staunchest opponents to basically what I call Black liberation in Chicago um, and coordinated and organized the effort that allowed Dante Servin to resign, elongated the process. And really in the process, uh, what let us know that she was terrible is the callous way she was dealing with the families uh, who had lost loved ones. In so, these um, you know, yelling at people, shutting people down, trying to prove that she's the principal. Yeah. Basically. So don't nobody know who she is. She comes out of nowhere. She's appointed by the mayor. And then for some reason, <laughs> and I love Leah, but, you know, WGCI brought her on in the morning, I think, mm. to not only talk about Rakia Boy, but to talk about Tyshawn Lee, a, a young person who had just got killed. Um, and she, like, had a good interview and then decided to launch a political campaign with the understanding that Rom was probably going to be again, but be one of the people. And then Rahm Emanuel had so much going on that he dropped out. And so there was this wide field of, like, 15 people running for mayor. Nobody like knew who was going to come out. And so basically, because there was nobody popular, all support kind of converged to her. So she really people don't know she like campaigned as this progressive, mm-hmm. uh, but she was a, a, a pro police prosecutor that got to prominence more or less by helping protect Rakia Boyd's killer. So that's where we know her from. And then the news started making her the shit. <laughs> yeah. We're like, of all the people in the city of Chicago, like her it was laughable. Like, cut the mic on like the brother of Rick, like mm-hmm. just like the worst visceral human. It's why I flame her so much. 
and we did too. That's the thing. Like, cause you know, we're like, we're shouting. <laughs> and so part of the things we like trained was like, and then kind of on some black shit, we would like start flaming our outfit and like, or with well, the black woman, you know, I, I yeah, just, like, because you know, we was thing. like going at her for being a, you know, <laughs> it's bad black people in our community. We have people that we don't fuck with, but we only let that, let that be known amongst each other. <laughs> You got to be truly, truly, <laughs> truly shitty at what you do to be a black gay woman and for everybody to be like, nah, fuck you, sis. Like, you got to go. You got to go. Get out of here. <laughs> who is you? Yeah, like, who, who is you? you? What is you people? doing? Why is you dressed like this? Like, come on. Because it's like, you're going to you're going to suck. You're going to be mean. You're going to make terrible decisions. First of all, if anybody's happy to do anything for Rom, red flag. Yeah. You make terrible decisions. You lie, and you can't dress. It would be di- like <laughs> there's a long line of well dressed liars. It's just <laughs> too many Chicago. things, and for you to rest on being black and gay is offensive to us out there who are doing the work of really making spaces inclusive mm-hmm. and really doing the work to protect black and gay people. So that's why it's offensive. Yeah, it's very offensive. Which is which is I, what I think. I don't I don't have the words to describe this, but when I refer to her as the first openly blay mayor, <laughs> I remember thinking you I make remember, that word up, right? <laughs> yeah. Right? That's going to the lexicon. <laughs> it has to. I hope it does. And I remember thinking, like, damn, is this offensive? No, because she's trash. Yeah. She's trash. <laughs> and she's tr- and she tried to run on being black and being gay. And I think what we're here to do is be like, yeah. That doesn't matter. You can't be a shitty person. Yeah. We're not just going to automatically rally behind you because you're a black gay woman. You're sending murderers off to vacation. You, My straw was on Jeanette Young. That's yeah. when I was like, that was violent. now I got to do the thing I do to people, <laughs> to you. <laughs> <laughs> Bring your ass here, boy. <laughs> yeah, come here, come here, come here. <laughs> and I think... It's it's really cool to see how like it being received uh well in a sense of like I th- I can tell people know it's more than me just being silly and using my talents. It's like this is how I protest. And and according to what people <laughs> saying on the internet, I'm nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you don't you don't cross the line. Like you could you could go harder, but like it's so I mean I, I want to get into now, like the, the the work of it, the 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 comedy, because there was um you know impersonation. It is a very difficult thing, and the nuance is like the the black and brown, like the, the emphasis <laughs> on black and brown. Mm-hmm. Voice crack on that. <laughs> so, so what was your 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 process of okay? I now yeah, you're right. This is a protest, right? Like I now have a target. Is there an instinctual talent you have of being able to like absorb these things? Did you like look at film where there's Would specific? You latch on? Yeah, I, how'd you break it down? You know, break her down. For so us. for her, <laughs> so overall in general, 2021 was the year that I discovered that basically I was putting all of my gifts and talents together and using them at once. So I majored in jazz in college, and so I studied voice. And so I literally understand the movement of the voice and the head voice and the throat and the larynx and the pharynx and placement and when you're singing nasally and when you're singing in your chest. So I literally know the placement of the voice. And every voice has a texture to it. It's like voice, texture, cadence. And so with her... I only watched about a minute of her because I couldn't listen to the <laughs> stupid <laughs> shit she was paper, saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and truly the me seeing headlines and reading articles and reading other people's opinions was enough for me to shape my own because it doesn't take much to realize that the police running into people's homes is wrong and that the mayor should be concerned. And so and maybe not lie. And maybe not lie to it. So when when you when you put that recipe together, that opens me up to go as far as I want to and to go as silly as I want to and to show how ridiculous it is. Satire is basically an elevated version of what you're satirizing. So if it's Lori in a meeting with a police, what's Lori's satirical version of that? Is her drawing on a map and thinking that that's going to work. Um, and also her defensiveness Mm-hmm. And her yelling at people, I, 
I thought about it for two seconds where it's just like, well, okay, you know, women in power do have a hard time being hard and, you know, blah, blah, blah. but then you see her emails <laughs> and you're yeah. like, no, I don't, yeah. if anything, I want to have a one-on-one <laughs> yeah. talk with her and be like, what's going on? So there's that, there's that tactical part of it. I just listened to a little bit of her voice. And once I got that, she hits her R's really hard. <laughs> really hard. He, so hard. Like she puts like R's and words like that are not there. Passive aggressive, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then the... The, ye- the literal yelling of sound bites that she wants to be positive. Like she, <laughs> when she yells black and brown, she, she wants the headline to be, Lori really cares about black and brown children. But what she gets is like, do you care? You have such a track record of not caring about black and brown children. So it's the, when you're satirizing a character, there's a layers to it where it's like, there's a physical impersonation because I know the formula of creating a voice doesn't mean I can do every voice. It has to naturally work with my voice box. And I do have a um, natural inclination to pick up other people's mannerisms. And I mean, we can call that being on the spectrum of some sorts where I fully understand that (laughs) there may be a little more at play than just me being talented. (laughs) (laughs) But I may have been that kid that was like, I just memorized this whole conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Let me recite it back to you. Um, so there's that natural inclination of me being able to uh, pick up certain people's mannerisms. When it comes to improvising an impersonation, that's when you just have to get into the how would so-and-so answer this question based off of things they've said prior but also highlighting the ridiculousness of it where you get a little bit of, you know, how they should answer it mixed in with how they actually answer it and a heightened version of it. So these are all things I think about in hindsight. Like, so for example, when I do Beyonce and Jay-Z, for me, in my mind, I always have it that Jay-Z really wants to please Beyonce (laughs) and he knows she's better than him. (laughs) So he's always going to speak from that place. Um, (laughs) And uh, we've, we've heard, I, Beyonce, if you're listening, you know I love you, girl. And she's you know, big, I'm from the hood the too. I heard I heard, you know, I'm from the hood too. We have heard you pronounce several words wrong in songs. So we like it, you just can't say worst when you're supposed to say worse, and just we don't hear that. So like, you know, I use it as an opportunity <laughs> to play that up. Um and also just always I always have her laughing and confident because she's Beyonce. So but yeah, I I would read just a little bit, get the major highlight of what she did, do a little fact checking on my own just to make sure I'm not um, bogus. The interesting part about all of it is people reach out to me to do things that, you know, deep down, they really wish the mayor of their city would be there for it. And that is sad. <laughs> so like there was somebody was like, we're having a ribbon cutting ceremony. I'm like... That is so sad. I have people be like, the water in my business is not can you. And I'm like, yo, this woman is really. And for us to have like a black woman mayor, we are so disappointed because the thing is, we know Chicago's a machine. We know she inherited bullshit. We know it's just truly effed up. We know, we know, we know. But. When I see your response to a black woman's house being broken into while she is naked, be you lying about knowing and lying about the calendar and stuff like that. I want to see outrage and not political outrage, but just like Mm -hmm. your humanity outrage of like, I cannot believe the city in which I am the mayor of. We have police officers accidentally going into the wrong home that around that time period, it was 51 houses they did that to. Mm-hmm. Anjanette Young was the one I was like, yo, nobody wants to put themselves out there for being the woman who got busted into their house being naked. But like that was like 51 houses that happened. So a lot of the content when it comes to the impersonations is stuff that truly rubs me the wrong way. She writes for me every day. She writes for me every single day. But there was a period in time where I would be here in my house with me and my daughter and my dog and be like, yo, damn, cops could just run up in here. 
Like, that's a reality. And and my mayor's a black woman. And in her city, the cops can just butt my dog's jumpy. My daughter's six. Like, there is some stuff that makes me so angry in real life and so, like, <laughs> like, what isn't anybody like it makes me um, to to justify my hysteria. I turn it into comedy because it the laughter is coming from a place of like when I found out it was 51 houses and not just Anjanette Young's. I was floored. I was like, that's not a mistake. That's incompetence. It's a regular historical that's, practice that's yeah. been happening for decades that she yeah. knew about before because that was her job before. It was to protect <laughs> the people who ran in people's houses. Yeah. You know, and so, yeah, it's, 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 she went on Sharpton like a week before the emails came out that proved that she was lying and tried to, you mm-hmm. saw that? It was yep. like she was trying to perform the thing that you would expect a human to have and just like, <laughs> It was it was so clear that like oh you were trying really hard mm-hmm, like, and you, you know how Sharpton ass you know he you know he a shucking job with anybody so he was really trying to, <laughs> he was trying to give her all that she could <laughs> but it it couldn't happen um, so to you know I could talk about this for for, for hours because there's a in addition to the interest and the way it like just intersects with things that are personal to me there's like a an appreciation and a gratitude that I have of that where it felt like a real communal service especially at a time where we were like at the height of trying to organize against her and just felt like gaslit at every term uh but to kind of transition out of i have two different questions that i'll just throw together at once and you can take either or both one is she's notoriously sensitive defensive and she has a team of 13 press aides that <laughs> have salaries uh <laughs> while she's cutting other departments she has 13 press aides so i'm i am confident that their office has seen this. Has there been any interaction or have you been blocked? Which I know they they block a lot of shit. Um, and the other one, which is kind of a floater, which you started to speak to is like, in then doing this and kind of stepping in this role in the city, did, did you learn anything, whether about the political process, around the demographics, around, you know, I hear you being really kind of fact-based around some of the, you know, the police corruption. So was this like a political education for you that you didn't expect? You were just trying to like get off some jokes and where did it take you? Yeah, it was, it was. <laughs> so wait, what was the first question? The first one was about, Do have, they you, know? have, they have you got any win back oh, from them oh, or how so they feel about it? Here is my inkling. So I have not, never talked to the mayor directly. <laughs> um, I know she knows. Um, and I know by like hearsay, like friends of friends of friends who have friends in the office are like, oh yeah, they be cracking up and blah, blah, blah. and that's even more concerning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they should, this is not a laugh with type of this situation. Is, that's concerning. <laughs> Here's my biggest indicator is that I don't know if anybody's noticed, but since I've been doing this, her attempt at dressing better has increased. Yes, definitely. That's all me. How can you can't tell me it's not? You can't tell me it's not. I give you that. I give you that. Like she ain't gonna change no police. She ain't gonna do nothing else. But she like I do not look like that. I'm gonna bring these hymns in a little bit. (laughs) So I feel like she's like, yo, you know, you flaming me for looking busted, and so her suits have gotten um, more fitted. And I think if it comes to anybody in her office wanting to reach out to me, I think what they'll figure out and discover is. Just like all those transferable skills when it comes to just people in comedy and business and stuff like that, that, yeah, I don't, I'm not doing this for views. I know how to use leverage to help this further support my career and grow my career because after that, I was able to do just different characters and then people were like, oh, Lisa can do characters. That's cool. So the thing that I want her to know is that I'm not doing this for attention. I already had attention. I need it so I don't go crazy. (laughs) And at one point in time, I did enjoy the conversations I was happening under some of the things that I post. And I was making people aware to look into stuff for themselves. What I learned is that, how can I say this? Chicago has not burnt to a crisp in the ground because of the communities, because of cohorts like y'all's, because of uh, like because of people doing the work in their lanes. And that's not going to stop. And the noise we make does make a difference, even if it's just amongst us to be like, OK, you know what? 
They really don't care. Less organized is food drive. So motherfuckers can eat because they, <laughs> they ain't going. I learned that a lot of people are very disappointed in the mayor. <laughs> I've learned that a lot of people genuinely business owners, leaders, they really want her ear and her support. And one thing when I started doing her live and in person, I remember thinking like, huh, it's almost as if I'm going to these small pockets of Chicago <laughs> and engaging with the citizens. <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't that hard. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Curious. <laughs> this, is, this is so weird. I'm in Hyde Park and I'm visiting stores and I'm talking to people. And when I do like longer live sets, these people ask real questions. <laughs> you're like holding town hall. You're, you're yeah. The, you're, the, you're the first mayor to visit that neighborhood in years. <laughs> but for real. And, I, yeah. and I, I want that to show the holes that our politicians are not filling. They're not filling in those gaps. They're too busy being politicians and too busy being like, I serve the people. But they're not talking to the people. And there's no question in my mind that a large community feels ignored by the mayor. And I also learned that things in politics take long because politicians take long. This whole police reform that people were waiting for for years, it's that type of neglect of like, are you even working on that? It's almost as if you don't want to do it. Yeah, like, do you care? How are you going to be nine months overdue on an assignment as mayor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I remember now what it, there was, a, um, just to kind of like wrap up that point, like there was a, uh, what's it called? It's called the the last year in Obama, the, the task, not the task force. Yeah, the consent decree stuff. The consent decree is the word, right? So, so that was one of the things she was really heralding and championing as you know, when she was working with the police as the president of the police board, who then became someone campaigning for mayor, was this consent decree. And I'm pretty sure we can fact check this. I'm within one or two margins of error. There were 155 recommendations and they rejected 151 of them. God. <laughs> so it's almost like they, you know, it was clear that the whole yeah. thing was a charade and a, and a, a satire in the first. It's, see, you know why I appreciate you? Is because they're making fun of us. That's what she's doing. She's joking and roasting us. Mm -hmm. to our I'm almost getting emotional about it. Like, it's, and she's it's, also not funny. That's it's bullying. You know, that it's, is it's like that is my biggest. Bullying. That is my biggest problem with her. When when people ask me what is my biggest problem with her, it's when she tries to be funny. And because, she tries so hard. And she tries so hard because my thing is, I got real people talking about their business water shut off. You the mayor. I'm the joker. I'm the comedian. You leave the jokes to me. I need you to be a mayor. COVID is not funny. <laughs> it's not. Like, nothing about what you're doing is funny at all. And that's the thing that kind of hurts me the most. It's like this current campaign, which I am really probably going to hop in the get up today because this campaign of why are we trying to make Chicago appealing to other cities in America? That's weird. Mm -hmm. I, there's so much other things you could be doing than just being like, we invented the mobile phone. Don't nobody, <laughs> girl. <laughs> really? <laughs> now? <laughs> You're not answering our calls. <laughs> you going to NYC to be like, Chicago's great. What? <laughs> like, yeah. that marketing Chicago, while your approval rating is negative 9,000%, it's just, I feel like she's doubling down on her office being able to do whatever they want to do and not answering to the people and making it seem like we are the people who just are going to complain about anything and everything just because that's what we do. We just sit in our homes and we're like, the mayor sucks. It's like, no, really, she does. And I love it when I see other people in other states being like, yo, I don't know what's going on in Chicago. And I'd be like, help us <laughs> look it up. It's yeah, wild. Yeah. <laughs> That national media spin, you know, just like Chicago often serves on the like Democratic Party kind of testing ground for the tactics they deploy in other places, you know, whether that's the mayor in New York being a black cop, um, you know, this this is this black prosecutor, black cop strategy. I'm starting to see, you know, between 
the more kind of grassroots resistance media stuff. Like there was an actual negative article around her in, neg- in national media le- last week in the New York Times. And it wasn't a slam. It was like breaking down. You know, it interviewed like Byron Lopez and Carlos Rosa and Stacey Davis Gates, like actual people doing things saying like, yeah, she's doing a terrible job. And like, that is enough. That plus some jokes, like Mm -hmm. you don't have to go on TV and do a whole campaign and you don't have to try to write jokes when you're not funny is really just like, like sketch. She's doing sketches. Why are you on national TV in the first place? Like it's an insult. The the fact that I'm seeing you on MSNBC during a crisis, why aren't you on local channels? Like, who are you even talking to exactly. right now? Exactly. Like, you you won't talk to us. Like, I remember when <laughs> people was like, you man. live in a mansion. And this is when, like, the Toledo thing was going on. And she didn't talk about him and dress him at all. One person was like, you live in a mansion. She was like, I do not. I, I was like, oh, so now you can <laughs> now you can tweet. I, yeah. It's just like, sometimes I want to have a one-on-one interview with her on some just, like, real black woman to black woman shit. Just be like, yo, like, what's going are you on? in therapy? <laughs> like, what's... <laughs> are you okay? Like, are you are you really okay? What are There's you There's obviously some healing that's that that she needs. Like, I I try to be human and like sympathetic to all people's things, and like she got some shit. There there has to be something. I'm like, who hurt you? Mm-hmm. Let's go into that. Let's talk about when you were seven, Lori. Because my my goal is to outlive her as an impression. I want to have more seasons of impersonating her than she has terms as mayor. And mm. if if something <laughs> yeah. happens where for in some God's earth, if she is the only one running for mayor again, you better believe I'm running until somebody, <laughs> my whole campaign is going to be like, please, please, somebody, until somebody else runs and then I'm going to drop out. <laughs> campaign for other people. I love mm-hmm. that. <laughs> well, <laughs> please don't vote <laughs> for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna do a uh, campaign trail tour. <laughs> well, you got a sponsor and a media platform that will <laughs> produce as much content as we can oh, to help support great. that. Oh, thank you. I mean, I'm talking running all the ads, yeah, yeah, all the yeah. slander campaigns against myself in my voice. <laughs> Did you know? <laughs> <laughs> this message was not endorsed by Lori. <laughs> Please do not endorse any of this. Oh man. Oh. Oh, what what a gift! What a thank gift! You. Thank you. Thanks so for much. going so deep. Thank you. That work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you, and thank y'all for all the work y'all do. I like to. It it feels good to me that like people with platforms like y'all truly even fuck with me. It gives me validations that I'm not uh, fucking up the work and that I'm adding to it. You <laughs> no, know, no, it was no, so no, there, cathartic there were in the, seeing these videos yeah, yeah. and like to get to the point where like. <laughs> a statement would come out and then I'd be like, I wonder if there's a video up about this. And like, give it a couple of the, like, <laughs> like when the, the CPS with the laptops and you're hoarding the lab, like <laughs> if you have a Chromebook in your house, we will find you. <laughs> we will. <get> you. <laughs> like, really- there's actually something I said in the live show that made me crack up. <laughs> um, I had said that the computers were on a one-to-one watch. Like there was a police officer assigned to every computer and they were all in my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely roasting her today. I'm gonna do the this whole money on the floor. Oh my god, we didn't oh even talk about god. that. Gotta do. And she gotta it's do. It's also that. such a like so cop for, for movie. time because yeah, this will come out in a couple yeah, weeks. Yeah, for people who may who may not remember this social media moment, you know, rap, rappers are being ridiculous again, and they're like making not even really clever or exciting statements with money but that's what's happening right now on instagram is like you know it used to be the money phone now it's the money statement and then lurie wanted to enter the chat with i have enough usher bucks i went to an usher concert and i bought <laughs> fake money <laughs> i have enough usher bucks usher to bucks. spell some things okay oh, <laughs> i have 100 usher bucks i'm ready <laughs> <laughs> my favorite statement on, so she spelled that for, for posterity she spelled that get vaxxed in uh with an abbreviate you know with the comma shortened it someone's like man if she hadn't given all the money to the cops she might have been able to spell out vaccinated you know <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> oh my god yep 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 and for we've re-referenced that a few times just i want to give people the figure for folks who might be hearing this in the future so at the height of the pandemic, when the first round of federal aid was coming to Chicago, we were granted $400 million. And in the time where businesses are closing, 
People are cut off from labor, houses, you know, housing crisis. She gave 280 of the $400 million to the Chicago Police Department. To pay over to pay overtime specifically for a lot of it. Yeah. $281 that, million. Dollars. Yeah. And at the time, they also did a housing program that paled in comparison of uh, support with rent. And 80,000 people applied and they only accepted 1,500. So th- just to, to give the, <laughs> the example of these are happening at the same exact time, these are the political choices that, that our chief executive is making for our municipality. Cops over kids is, is, is her game. So Godspeed on the, hmm. on the, uh, on the impressions because one needs someone to laugh and it's working. Yeah. Shit works. Thank you. Thank you. I, <laughs> I want to, my goal is I want, I know they're, they're never going to do it because they're so serious, but I want to, I want to do Lori Lightfoot on like MSNBC or like oh CNN, or just like a serious news. <laughs> There's got, so one, I love the idea of you in conversation with her in real life, but I also think a long form interview between like cutting back and forth between you as you and you interviewing her is one of the funniest things I could possibly oh. imagine. So the day that you want to do that podcast, do yourself, we're yeah. here. We got the mic. We can do a whole thing. Um, Lisa and Lori uh-huh, meets. A town okay. hall type, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, in yeah, co- yeah, yeah, Charlie yeah, Rose yeah. style in conversation. Um, oh. Or maybe could you could you do an Oprah? <laughs> so <laughs> I've been working on my Oprah. <laughs> there are times where I can do it and I can't, but Oprah's in me. She's in all of us. <laughs> Whether, Whether you, you like, like it or not. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> you have to know. I realize the secret to her being such a great speaker is she be pausing to think of what to say next. <laughs> is that she's talking to you like she's telling you a secret. That's the, you that's the have secret. to know. What my aha moment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh. oh my god! Oh. Give me the give me the right wig. Yeah, absolutely. Because oh there there are some characters that if you are so good on the personality side and how they would answer, you could do your voice exactly. Mm-hmm, yeah. And mm-hmm. it still hits. For mm-hmm. anybody out there who want to do impersonations and you're not a talented jazz singer, you <laughs> still can. <laughs> if you get if you get the spirit right, people will won't even pay as much mm-hmm. attention to the voice. For mm-hmm. sure. The embodiment. If you if you can like live in someone's body and then their cadence can mm-hmm. can like uh, approximate vocal tones sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So don't want to just end or yeah, yeah. We should we should be considerate of your time, but I don't want to just end talking about Lori because you know you are and, and are doing so much more. So just to kind of like wind us down, what are some of the excitements that you are on your horizon? Let's pretend like your your career is a campaign. Like what's, what, oh, <laughs> you have to get yes. reelected. What, what are so you promising? What's I've coming been forward? Developing, <laughs> I've been developing a lot of cool material. So basically what people are going to see in the, the next year or so is all of my characters begin to interact with one another. Ah. What I'm doing is if I parody a, a person, I want to parody like Marvel <laughs> and be like, all these characters live in a universe. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to just keep having fun with that. And then I'm going to start doing more long form content and some more live stuff. I'm being very vague, but like I want to take more characters live. So the Laugh Factor was the first time I did Margaret Thatcher live and I was surprised that it worked. So a show that I want to do so badly um, is called Political Women. And I want to have uh, Allison Reese as Kamala. She does a perfect <laughs> Kamala, uh, my friend Sharice Hamilton is Tony Preckwinkle, and because <laughs> she's really tall, <laughs> and and we just have fun and just improvise and just like have quote unquote debates and just like it just be a good show. And um, I want to start doing more music. Basically, I'm getting into this area of. I'm not doing what people think I should be doing at my stage of my career. I'm doing exactly like what I want to do, which is have fun. So like I'm going to do a a six week run of an improv duet at the annoyance. I don't love improv like that, but I do like to play every once in a while. So I'm going to do that. That's going to be fun. Um, My thing is I want to keep my stuff free and accessible and, and get money from the white people to sustain my antics however that looks um working on some show ideas with friends really just like making sure i keep doing the things that make me laugh as opposed to the things i think people want to see well we're excited to see what where that builds and what comes next 
Yeah. And thank you again for taking the time to dig into all this and, and, and talk with us over the last you know hour and change. Really appreciate you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a joy. How can folks find you and your work in the ways you want to be found? Yeah, I'm at Lisa B. Evolving Everywhere. Formerly at Lisa B. Experience, but I changed it to at Lisa B. Evolving. Oh, I need. I, wait, 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 wait. We got to dig on that. Dig in on that. How, what was the transition from experience to evolution? Let's. let's so I got. I had here? a tarot reading, and I asked. You didn't think that's how that was going to start? I had a tarot reading. <laughs> Not surprised. And, and Frank, <laughs> you don't see all the damn candles by me. <laughs> that's why I was like, that looked like spiritual shit. <laughs> Shout out to Jenna. <laughs> and. I was running out of questions. Like, we did all the serious questions. She was like, any more? I was like, yeah. I want to change my social media handle to the evolution of Lisa B. And she did something with the cards, and then she laughed at me. And she was like, you got to evolve first. And I was like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> she read me, yo. So <laughs> She was like, Lori uh, Lightfoot looking at ass. Get out of here. Right, get your Lori Lightfoot looking at So <laughs> I was like, Okay. So I decided to go with Lisa B. Evolving to acknowledge that I haven't evolved all the way, but also to get a little help by having people see that, say that, read that, share that. So I kind of have like assistance with evolving. Uh, so it's like I got people being like, Lisa B. Evolving. Lisa B. Evo- yeah, people <laughs> just say, Lisa B. Evolving. So that's kind of... All right, because B of- is like the... Of the verb exactly. be. Uh-huh. Like, like, yeah. Like yeah, Lisa be out here evolving this shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'll evolutionize. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's powerful. Uh, <laughs> right. Well, I think that uh that'll do it. Make sure you uh stay in tune with Lisa and uh stay up on on the shenanigans of our of our mayor um and beyond. Uh we're at Ergo Radio. I'm at Ergo Kiss. I'm at Damon underscore AF. And we'll be back on the line reshaping the culture of Chicago and beyond for the more liberatory and creative. Much love to the people. Peace.